world poetry, Monglong mysticism, and being a ghosty. Now, maybe you're thinking, I know what he's saying, but I didn't ken what he means. So if all that was Greek to you, don't worry, because this is a special episode with a special guest. We've got Brian Holton coming on this episode, who is a, well, he's an amazing translator of Chinese to English poetry. But he's also the premier, maybe the only, uh, translator of Chinese to Scots, and he's going to be talking to me about a poet who's all about world poetry, Monglong poetry, let's say, Monglong mysticism, and being a ghosty, being a ghost. And um, we'll find out exactly what being a ghost means for the poet Yang Lian in my chat with Brian Holton. But before that, I'd like to talk a wee bit about the churchific news part of the show where I talk about what's new in the world of Chinese literature or translated Chinese literature perhaps. So um, first we news item is about sci-fi, I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear. It's uh, the author Chen Fan, who was a guest on the episode of the show on his novel The Waste Tide. He's, I, I, honestly he keeps coming up. I end up talking about Chen Fan a lot because he's a cool guy. Um, and BBC World Service obviously have recognised the fact he's a cool guy because he appeared just today actually on their show so he'll be that that little clip of him on the bbc world service will be up for you guys to download and listen to online and i'll put a link to it in the show notes as well um i'm not actually sure what he talked about yet because i've not listened to it but i imagine it will be something about uh ecological concerns modern china and what sci-fi has got to do with both of them that's what I would expect, but I could be wrong. I have not found out yet, so find out for yourselves. See what Chen Fan is talking about on the BBC. The wonderful BBC. Next news item. It's about a couple of uh, female Chinese authors who are writing about... Well, you know what's going on in Wuhan right now, but for future listeners listening in uh, 2120, it's, the, it's about the coronavirus lockdown that's been happening this year. Um, so it's Jan Gerling who is writing from Berlin and Fang Fang who is writing from Wuhan itself. And I, the reason I've got this in the news is because translations of what they've been writing are available. Uh, Jan Gerling's writing is... Oh, pause. Sorry, that was my coronavirus alarm. Uh, I've been infected and I'm going to die uh, in a week, which means enough time to get this episode out. Um, so Yang Ge Ling's writing is available on uh, the Paper Republic site. Um, Nikki Harmon herself has translated it, so a link to that will be up in the show notes. And Fan Fang's writing is available in translation on Tai Xin, uh, a very good website for all things about uh, China, especially the news. So I'll link to both of those in the, sh uh, the show notes, the episode description. And the last little news item is about wuxia, um, so genre fiction again, wuxia being Chinese like kung fu fantasy, think of um, from a we for, 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 uh, us as western uh, consumers of pop culture, think of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, that's, we that's wuxia. Um, now there's a, a, a guy who's probably the premier translator, I know I keep saying premier, but he's the top translator as far as I'm aware of uh, Chinese wuxia. Um, but on the internet, he's not really been involved with anything in print, but he's the online uh, Wuxia translator. His name, or his, his tag uh, inter internet username is Deathblade. And I got this news via Deathblade's Twitter account, which funnily enough is at Deathblade. He's, he's announced that I think the best online, uh, online site, that's a bit of an oxymoron, the best website for reading Wuxia, translated Wuxia online, Wuxia World, has launched an app for uh, just for iPhones on the iOS uh, store, the Apple store. I don't have an iPhone, so I will not be downloading this app yet. But if Wuxia is your thing and you have an iPhone, go get the Wuxia World app. If you like Wuxia and aren't reading it online yet, go to the Wuxia World website and see if you can find what Deathblade and his contemporaries are, have been up to. Um, you may know this if you're listening to this podcast, but um, some Wuxia has been brought to print in translation recently, so if, if you'd rather read a physical book, please do go check out uh, Jin Yong's, uh, the translation of Jin Yong's series Legend of the Condor Heroes. 
I believe the second book is out now, third one on, is on its way, I think. I've read the first one, it was very good, I can vouch for it. So yeah, that is the Trisha fake news. Now, there's one more thing to do before we can zoom on to the interview with Brian Holton, and that's a little listener feedback section where we um, had some some of the fans of the show, um, new listeners, more long-term listeners, although the show's not I mean, the show's a year old now, so I suppose there are long-term listeners. But I'm just going to um, read out what they've been saying, what feedback they've been giving. And this goes without saying, but if you're listening and you'd like to give out, give feedback, um, the, the show's got a Facebook presence, it's got a Twitter presence, an Instagram presence. These are all great places to get in touch with me, and I'll be giving information, like the URLs and whatnot, in the show notes. But I'll, I'll also give out like proper... Um, pointers for all that at the end of the show after the interview so without further ado uh, let's hear what the listeners were saying so i got uh, a little comment about the name uh, jian guo translation build the nation and about those kind of red names if you remember in the last episode on mo yan's radish me and my guest lehila were uh, talking a little bit about that so another former guest uh, also a lady from the usa michelle dieter um gave gave some little comments about that on the uh, podcast's facebook page so i'll just read what she said about that because i think it's um an interesting question to feedback not just to me but to you guys the listeners especially since i'm just one person and this is really a question for readers in general. Bearing in mind Michelle's a translator who's always looking for tips and feedback and whatnot. So here's what she says. So about people named Jiang Guo, I'm reading a book right now where one of the characters is named Build the Nation, Jiang Guo, and it's used to show that he's a stuffed shirt, part of the establishment. The character is top brass in the Public Security Bureau's Bureau, but as your guest says, names are tricky. If I wanted to translate the book, how would I let the average reader enjoy that level of meaning? So this is, I replied, well, as the podcast, this is what I said. As a reader, I'd be okay with a little footnote giving the characters, giving, yeah, giving the characters behind the pinion and explaining their meaning. And then I said I wouldn't want, like, the character's name to be translated itself, like, to something like, if his surname was Chen, I wouldn't want him to be Chen Nation Builder. I just want him to be Chen Jianguo. And then maybe if a footnote told me what Jianguo meant, that'd be good. And then in the comment, I've uh, continued on to say, if he's a stuffed shirt, his actions should show it. But a little footnote pointing to the meaning of the name would help emphasize that. But if you guys, uh, both, if, if any translators are listening, and if any readers are listening, this is, you know, I, I don't think this is strictly a question with an objective answer. I'm fairly convinced I'm right. But if anyone has uh, other nuances that they want to bring up, or if anyone just straight up disagrees with me, please, please uh, get in touch, because... I'm not, I'm only 90% convinced I'm right on that one. I don't necessarily think my word is law. Oh yeah, I've got another um, really nice piece of listener feedback. This is from uh, an older listener. I don't know how old this listener is. I don't know if it's a man or a woman, but um, this listener has described himself as a senior citizen. And we had a little exchange on Twitter that started off uh, talking about Chen Fan, and I, I liked it so much. I think I'll read out... Um, a little bit of what this uh, person said. So I only know their Twitter um, name, which is Steuer ba- Here we go. Steuer Beraterin. Steuer Beraterin. Steuer Beraterin. Sorry, German listeners. But yeah, it's um, it's a Ger- German name. Steuer Beraterin. Yes. And I was just talking with Steuer Beraterin on Twitter, and this person said, I recommended your podcast on Clark's World to my fellow Chinese language students at Confucius Institute, a Confucius Institute somewhere in the German-speaking world, I guess. And, you know, the three German-speaking countries. I think there's only three. Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Anyway, let's let's stop waffling. Keep reading this one tweet, which I'm still only halfway through. You know, this is this is the, the, the tweet continuing, by the way. You know, I am the senior citizen, in quotes, student in the class, and I have to promote reading and culture to the kids. Kids, in quotes. Smiley face. And I said, fantastic, keep spreading the word. And Steuer Baratarin said, I will. My mantra is, I've always imagined that paradise will be a kind of library, but in real life, unfortunately, in, in quotes here, too many books, too little time. Your podcast is very helpful to find good books. 
Fantastic. Um, one of my missions is to indeed like just bring more attention to the individual books and translated Chinese fiction as a whole. But if it's serving like the more practical purpose of, of recommending things that people could seek out and read, fantastic. Um, I always make a point, if it's something I've read online, I provide a link. Uh, if it's something that's just a more traditionally published book, I'll always talk about who the publishers are. So fantastic that um, it's helping at least one of you guys find interesting things to read. And again, if you want a recommendation, like, if, I don't know, if you've got any questions about other things, please do ask me. Um, I did have, not strictly a listener of the show, a friend of a friend asked me, he's like, tell me, recommend me a, a, a translated Chinese book. And I was like, you can just listen to the podcast because he's not a listener. Uh, but yeah, um, if you want recommendations, all the episodes have discussions of books that could work as a little like uh, reading companion for you. But if if you want to know more things, although I'm not an expert, I love to talk about this stuff. So yeah, uh, one more little piece of feedback to go. So this is actually a um, discussion not about any past episodes, but about this one, because I did a wee tweet saying that I was editing this episode and listening out to see whether as I was talking to Brian Holton, if my own accent would uh, double up. So um, one of our listeners, I think one name she goes by is YY. Um, name on Twitter is Codename Mama. I don't know why. But um, YY, aka Codename Colon Mama, that is colon the punctuation mark, not Codename Colon Mama, um, said, it's just how we feel about our accents, i.e. that they change in situations. I try to speak in a relatively neutral mid-Atlantic accent, but when I speak to anyone from my country, which I think is Singapore, slash a country where the native language isn't English, code switching is intuitive. So if any of you guys have any of your own experiences or thoughts about your voice changing, either consciously or unconsciously, given the situation, which I guess is what we call code switching, fantastic. Um, I know that we have listeners of a fairly interesting range of backgrounds. Um, I think my oh gosh, I'm Scottish, sometimes I sound more Scottish, sometimes I sound less, is probably one of the least interesting of, out of all you guys' different instances where you might be code switching. So please, if you want to talk about that, um, do so. And you don't have to talk to me. There is a Facebook discussion group, and obviously Twitter is an open an open forum. So it doesn't have to be unidirectional, everyone running to me. If, if uh, you want ways to talk to other fans then, you know, there are ways we can make it happen. Speaking of which, um, I have not yet made a Yang Lian uh, Instagram group chat, but once I'm done recording this episode, uh, I'll make that. So by the time you're listening to this, uh, if you would like to join a little chat about Yang Lian or indeed Brian Holton, uh, I'll have made a group or I'll have sought to make a group on Instagram for that. So contact the show's Instagram. Again, the... Uh, <coughs> The username for that will be in the show notes. I'll tell you it now. Turchific, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. I'll also name it. Name it. I'll also spell it again at the end of the show. Right, so that's all our listener feedback. We may as well charge on now and listen to my chat with Brian Holton. And it was a really good one. He, he, what a top. What a top guy. What a cheerful guy. I'm sure you'll enjoy everything he had to say. And the readings we did. You're going to hear some poetry from Chinese in Scots. So you've got that to look forward to. Five four, three, two, five, four, three, two, yen. Wu, se, san, r, i. I'm on the show. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the show with Brian Holton. Are you right, Brian? Fit like you? Aye. Oh, just hanging there, three d again. Aye, right. good. And can you tell uh, the listeners a wee bit about yourself? Well, I was born in Galway. Galley Shields to the polite mm. map makers. And if you're born in Galley, the, na- the neighbours here for Selkirk and Hike and thereabouts will cry you pale merk. Because it's, it's a matter of historical fact that Galley was the last of the border tunes to get indoor plumbing. Right. So our neighbours reckon that we've still got the, the, the merk of the pale on our erses. <laughs> That's terrible. So I'm, oh, I'm a prude pale merk. But uh, my parents were living in Nigeria, so we, we lived in Lagos. Mm. And then came home, lived in Edinburgh, at Falkirk, and in a boot Falkirk, and then back down to the borders when I was 13. So my accent is kind of, and my dad was Irish. My mother was uh, was for the border, Gully and Walkerburn. Um, her family was Gully and Selkirk. So I'm a kind of mix of uh, Lothian and border when I'm speaking. Mm. 
And what else? Uh, I did a degree in Chinese. I was at Galley Academy doing classics, and the, the Hidi thought I should be a minister. But I was refused, oh, sorry, what's the word? Recused oh. uh, religious observance because I was brought up as a socialist. Whoops. And this man deaved the life out of me because he was some evangelical nut. He was removed a couple of years later for. He was never allowed to be with, with Barons again. That's good. But um, uh, as a reaction against that, <clears throat> I saw Edinburgh was doing Chinese, and I discovered, uh, shortly before, I discovered Arthur Whaley's translations and Pound. Mm. And I just thought, oh, I'll do that. So yeah. uh, I, I did that. And then <clears throat> I finished my postgraduate work just in time for Thatcher's experiment with the economy, and there were no jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was on the dole for a long time. And... Um, then on, on uh, job creation, which is when I started publishing translations because I had the time. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose people today might feel they're in a similar situation. People stuck in their homes who, you know, depending on whether or not they can work from home, mm -hmm. suddenly have time to be creative. Well, yeah, this is it. I mean, this, uh, you know, the, the sort of set late 70s, early 80s um, was a disaster economically. Mm. Um, but... Uh, benefits were a lot more generous then, and a lot of young people with time on their hands. I mean, look at the music, the literature, uh -huh. you know, the stuff that boomed the Irvin Welsh generation, uh, the punk movement, and also, of course, the home rule movement. Right. You know, and, and magazines like St. Castus and Radical Scotland that, that changed our lives. Mm. Um, so. While we're talking about radicalism, so the wee uh, intros and little mini bios uh, about yourself and your career that I've read mentioned that you were interested in or you chose to go and study Chinese one because you were already from a very multilingual uh, kind of household family yeah. house yeah. and also that you'd come across Arthur Whaley's translations were interested um, but you also mentioned that you had a kind of like a, a socialist upbringing so was the the fact that China was you know not a capitalist country was that a source of interest for you or was it that not really well, the draw? It, it was when I started learning right it was principally the classical stuff that interested me mm. um, you know both this must have been something for that when my father and mother met he was in the army and a uh, in Gallic Shields on an exercise, and um, his father and uncle, my great uncle, were engineers with the Ben Line uh, who sailed to the Far East. Right. And my two of my mother's uncles, one by marriage, were engineers with the Ben Line who sailed to the Far East. And all four of them died in the flu epidemic a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. um, which must have been something for them to talk about. Uh, but uh, the upshot was both grandparents' houses were full of stuff. I mean, I'm, at the moment, I'm looking at a couple of, on top of each of my, my loudspeakers for my hi-fi, I have uh, a little, on the left, I have a, a little Japanese bronze figure, and the other a Chinese altar figure of a Lohan, kind of Buddhist saint, both of which were brought back by my Uncle Alec from uh, the Far East. Amazing. So I grew up with this stuff. And of course, our house was full of African things. But despite having been surrounded by this, it had never occurred to me that Chinese folk wrote poetry. Right. You know, it was like a shock when I found Whaley in the school library. What the uh -huh. heck was this? So I decided to, to do it. This isn't really related to translated Chinese fiction at all. And I, it's just a little anecdote about myself that I don't think I've told on the show before that relates a little bit to your story. So I'm, I'm from Dundee and Dundee, for listeners who don't know, um, its industrial past is very much linked to India and um, northwest, uh, northeast India and Bengal because uh, of the jute industry. So a little bit like yourself, I had a great grandfather who went out there to be something equivalent to your modern like Western expat. He was an engineer out uh, training the Indian engineers to basically replace the Scottish engineers. And my grandpa, who passed away a few years ago, was there as a wee boy for a few years. So for a long time, this was just like a thing in theory. I knew about my granddad that he had um, ridden on an elephant once. But um, I went via Kolkata for a few days when I went back to China one time. And it was maybe a similar experience to you learning that this is a real place with real people who write real poetry. Sure enough, I visited this place mm -hmm. and it, it was more than just a story about my granddad riding on an elephant when he was seven or whatever. Mm. Oh, no, I'd love to go back to Lagos. Uh, I still remember her address, 26 Point Road, Papa, if anybody's listening. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, 
Maybe, maybe one day. And what, what's your uh, connection with Chinese? Um, good question. When I finished my English uh, literature degree, I didn't really have any like plans career-wise, but both my parents had mentioned like children of friends who had uh, following uni gone off and done a year teaching in Asia. So mm-hmm. I wasn't actually, uh, people often, my Chinese friends in China would say, why did you choose China? And I had to say, well, sorry to disappoint you. I, I knew I wanted to go very far east and the best job offer happened to be uh, from a Chinese company. Mm-hmm. So that, that snowballed into um, living there for basically three and a half years. Uh, mostly, well, all working in schools, although two and a half years of that or two years of that um, was in the, a school's writing center. So basically proofreading a lot of their stuff and doubling as a substitute teacher. So I didn't, I haven't really done any formal study. Um, and my Mandarin is probably low intermediate or advanced beginner. Uh, I'm not really a language expert, but I've, uh, have become very interested in reading the literature and translation. Yeah. But if you can order a beer and a, and a bowl of noodles, you're doing fine. Mm-hmm. You know, I talk yeah. about it as noodle Chinese. It's very easy. Oh, yeah. Noodle yeah. Chinese, uh, taxi Chinese. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. All the survival skills. Uh-huh. Well, I, yeah. I, used to t- I used to attract students. I had a big poster at Newcastle. We used to do in Freshers Week. We used to have to attract students. Um, and it said, no tense, no number, no gender, no verb endings, no irregular <laughs> verbs, no noun endings, no declension, no conjugation, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> That would, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I would usually rattle those things off if I'd met like a foreigner who was newly arrived and terrified. I was like, this language is actually not so hard. And I would gloss over the hard points and just talk about the easy bits. Of course, I mean, reading and writing uh, mm. is a different matter. Learning to read, learning the characters isn't difficult, it's just slow. But right. the problem is, especially, I mean, it can happen at any point, but especially when you go into pre-modern stuff, then there's a way of thinking that is so different. And even right. even on the street, you know, it's just a familiar thing to language learners. I can what he's saying, but what the hell does he mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You know, I used to, when I taught translation to Chinese students, uh, I did a thing on idioms, um, a session on idioms, and I started by writing on the blackboard, um, away the messages. But they knew all yeah, the words. Right. They knew, every, they knew every word, but they had no idea what it was about. Anyway, right. Yeah. Question. Next question. Questions. Um, so we've talked a bit about yourself and we, as we've seen, we probably could keep doing that for an ever and ever, but now I'd like <laughs> to ask you some questions about your frequent long haired collaborator and subject of this episode, uh, Yang Lian. So uh, first week question has a little bit of a preface. So throughout the course of doing this podcast and talking to people online, generally speaking, listeners of the show, um, I've been recommended quite a few times by people whose judgment I trust very much that I should check out the Misty Poets. And one of the, those people is Yang Lian. He is or was, depending on, I guess, I don't know how you view things, a Misty Poet. So my question for you is kind of twofold. Who were slash are the Misty Poets? And to what extent uh, does Yang Lian fit in the mold of the archetypal Chinese Misty Poet? Okay, these are a bunch of guys who in the late 70s started to write uh, a new poetry. They were angry. They mm. were kind of, this is after the Cultural Revolution, which was put an end to in 1976. Imagine uh, people like Gunter Grass in Germany having to learn to write German again without mm. the Nazis. And like Grass said about, Grass said about um, the Nazis that they had polluted the German language and we have to purify it again. So that's exactly how they felt. I don't know if any of them, some of them may have known about Gunter Gass, uh, mm. but the idea was that the, the, the party had uh, broken the Chinese language and they wanted to invent a new language that you could dream in, they said. Right. So highly um, you know, abstruse poetry. Um, it, Misty is a translation of the Chinese word Meng Lung. Meng Lung. And Meng Lung, Meng Lung was like, you know, vague in, in the distance, in the haze over the sea, something will appear vaguely. So mm. it's haze, vague. But it was used as a term of, of, uh, of uh, almost abuse by the official, one of the official communist newspapers reviewing a volume of, of Meng Lung poetry. Right. And he, it wasn't called that then, but of young poets. And he called it Meng Lung. And they thought, yeah, that'll do that. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> exactly. Um, Zabina Peschel in the 90s translated it. She suggested translating it as hermetic lyricism. 
mm. which is quite good because the point was it was lyrical poetry and it wasn't uh, you know there's none of the socialist realist stuff Mm. You know, about the heroic workers and great harvests and, and building tractors, um, which had gone what, what had gone before in the fifties and sixties. It was about expressing the inner self, but because the inner self is not, um, it's it's not public. So it can only be expressed in terms of hermetic, in the sense that they're only understood by the um, subconsciously, if you like, or internally. Right. So hermetic lyricism, they were making a new voice. They wanted a new language to dream in. So, I mean, people like, what what makes Yang the end different is, mm. I mean, he was the baby of the family. He was very much, you know, the other guys were older than him. Right. Um, uh, Bay Dahl, for instance, has moved, it was always a bit more autobiographical. And his poetry became kind of more smaller, more private. Mm. And he turned to writing autobiographies and, and, and stuff. Um, I mean, he's still working and he's a major poet, but guys like Man Ko, who were really profoundly important, um, Man Ko stopped writing poetry for many years. Hmm. Um, but, and then the, 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 the major woman was Shu Ting, they were mostly guys. Gu right. Trung, of course, killed, uh, Gu Trung, of course, killed himself and his wife. Um, yeah. He, yeah. Was, he was not a well boy. No. I mean, I mean, once and they clearly was there was uh, so anyway mm. so um, apart from Beta, most of them have fallen away from poetry but then many this happens a lot many poets stop writing in middle age don't they mm. it, it's a sort of thing like like punk music that you do when you're young <laughs> right and they were very much like punks mm. had they been allowed these guys could have filled uh, football stadiums because they were never allowed to. When, no. when I went to China first in 88, I mean, these guys were like rock stars. And still, when Yang and I are doing readings, there, there are Chinese ladies of a certain age who gather <laughs> groupies, you know. Oh, when I was a student, you know. Um, oh but I think one of the, one of the differences is he's, he's kept on writing and kept on developing, and his poetry is getting larger and larger in many respects. Mm. Um, he's, he's, you know... I've, we have a mutual friend, the Dutch poet, uh, Arjen Denker, who does a wonderful imitation of Yang Lian. We must go deeper. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this, you know, so Yang is unlike the Misty poets in, in that he's trying to act as a bridge between classical culture and the modern sensibility. Mm, that's that's like one of his... Panning out rather than panning in sort of a thing. Well, going deeper, going, going deeper. deeper, right? Yeah, yeah, but yes, you could say that. Yes, yes, mm. uh, that'd be a good way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's like oh, yeah, this is not quite relevant, but it's a great story. After I came back from my year in China after Tiananmen, mm. um, it was Circuit Common Riding Week. I was living in South at the time, and uh, there was a heat wave, and it was scary. You know, when you first come back, that first few days of culture shock. All these yes. pink people with yellow hair and stuff. I came um, back during a heat wave myself, actually. It was nice because I was worried I was going to lose Chinese summer, and I, and I didn't. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But anyway, I bumped into somebody at a Kenter since we were teenagers, and she says, oh, I hadn't seen you for a while. I said, have you been away? I says, ah, I said, I've been in China. Oh, she says, we were in Edinburgh last week. <laughs> Which is, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Well, it's two things. It's two things. It's, it's one is the small town. It's binary. It's here and no here. Uh -huh. you know? yep. But the other thing is she has such a deep root in Selkirk. Right. Me, I was, you know, I was born in Galway, but I lived in, in Lagos and I lived in Edinburgh. And in, as an adult, I've lived in England and, and China and Hong Kong. It's mm -hmm. uh, going, going wide and going deep. You know, both are necessary. Right. Yeah. Uh, Yang is trying to go very deep to in order to go wide. Mm. The modern, you know, modern consumer society, the, the modern world we live in has thrown the baby out with the bathwater, especially in China, where pre-modern culture, yeah. not well before the Communist Party, it started a uh, uh, hundred years ago with the end of empire, that it was Chinese culture that helped, kept China backward, was the idea, and that uh, China should adopt Western culture wholesale. Mm -hmm. uh, and Yang is trying to, He's not alone. Younger poets are doing it too. But he's trying to sort of, what's the French word? Reculer pour sauter. To step back, to, to jump further. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I refer to this episode a lot, but the very first episode of the podcast is on uh, Lu Shun and his Diary of a Madman. And um, as as much as I like Lu Shun and I've only the only other writer of of the new culture movement I've read is Ding Ling, who also got an episode on. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But as much as I think these these uh, guys are really awesome, and I can like, uh, I I feel like the whole the whole mission of saving the country is one I that resonates with me. But the more I read about them, the more I, you you hear um, people of of the mind that the new culture movement, which is that mm-hmm. kind of pro Westernization, save the country movement in some ways has a lot to answer for. And I'm sure that's probably Yang Lian's point of view. Yes. I mean, if you, if you think about Victorian attitudes in Scotland to Gaelic and to Scots. Right. Yeah. Know, they have to be extirpated in order to be, you know, choose your ad- adjective, progressive, modern, Christian, whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, Yang, uh, Yang and I are in deep agreement with that. And it also, my twin brother Harvey, who was writer in residence at Duncan and Jordanston for a few years. Oh, right. Uh, it's the uh, art school in Dundee, by the way, guys, yeah. who are listening, which is where I'm from. Yeah. That's right. Well, he stayed just at the other side of the Tay. If it wasn't for a stand of trees, you could actually see from his house near the Galgrick. You could you can actually see Dundee if it was a stand of trees in between. Oh, so, that's annoying. Uh, I'm actually, I'm in Fife right now, actually. The Again, for listeners, the the bit on the other side of the river from Dundee. I'm I'm just on the road to St Andrews in Edenside. Edenside, do I can? I'm my first wife is from St Andrews. So, All right. Uh, I've I've got five connections. My, my twin brother spent most of his life in Fife mm. there, but um, he and Yang were great pals, and um, from both of us, Yang got this. Uh, it was a major change. Uh, that article that you that you were going to talk about later. Mm. Um, talking about how Yang's poetry changed. I think one change that was major for him after exile was um, actually meeting my brother. Oh, right. Harvey. Harvey took him to see Macbeth's castle, and that made a profound impression. Oh, fantastic. And he and Harvey were very close. So, um, you know, we, we, because we all had, we all have a joint project, which is digging back to go forward. We Mm. can't let Scots, we can't let Scots D. Right. And Harvey, was about that and also uh, you know his kind of pagan his ideas about reviving pagan culture and yang going back to the classical heritage and integrated it into the modern it's we're all doing the same thing Mm -hmm. that's fantastic there was something that popped up when you were talking a little bit earlier about the period um yang and the misty poets were writing in and how they were angry men and that made me think back to what you said when when you got into um i guess translating um, when Margaret Thatcher was having her wee experiment mm-hmm. in the like late 70s. So it's, it's just funny to think that different sides of the world, you guys didn't know about each other. The societies were going through very different moments, but at the same time, there were some parallels in the tracks. Well, let me give you a German word, Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist, the, yeah. The spirit of the times. Mm-hmm. Astrologers, astrologers will have more complex explanations as well. But... <laughs> Yeah. So, so it's uh, Dr. Jung. <laughs> yep, um, synchronicity. Um, which, like yeah, I was talking about some, I don't know if the word synchronicity came up, but the episode before this one, I was talking about the world of the weird with the big W, which I think is mm-hmm. very big on that stuff. Um, the other thing that popped into my head um, when you were talking about the damage, so to speak, done to the Chinese mm-hmm. language by the party, there is another podcast technically it's my rival um that what is it called the chinese literature podcast and they've got some episodes on the kind of poetry that was being promoted by the government or, or whatever at that time and there's an episode i've listened to a few times it's called uh, ode to a dumpster ode to a dumpster truck and it is a <laughs> poetryless poem just praising yes. dumpster trucks which i don't know I, I like as an idea but they seem they were pretty convinced that it was a very bad poem and i'll take your word for it <laughs> Well, it could be a good idea and a bad poem, or, mm. you know, there, there are many too. And my grandfather was a socialist, my mother's father. He mm. went to, he was a blacksmith for Duns, and he went to the First War and learned about grand opera, socialism, and internal combustion engine, and that, you know, these three defined his life. But right. he used to say to me, socialism isn't about tractor sun. Socialism is about sleeping in the sun. There you go. Amen. <laughs> I like that now, very much. Next question. Next question, yeah. Uh, before we start reciting <laughs> the Communist Manifesto. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about Yang Lien's kind of 
his persona and his uh, artistic uh, project or whatever you want to call it. But I, I, I've, I think I noticed watching some readings uh, he was doing on YouTube or listening to the audio of the readings and then playing video games so that I wouldn't get bored. Uh, not, not that he's boring, I just <laughs> couldn't really sit and watch someone reading a poem online for two hours. Um, but anyway, I've heard him talk a lot, that's what I'm trying to say, and he's fantastic to listen to, and he seems very upbeat. But when I was reading a narrative poem, which is the book slash very long poem that we are, is the uh, text subject to this episode, I was noticing it's, it's very dark in a lot of points, and the cover art that's been picked is a painting uh, by Gao Xingjian, who's a Nobel Prize winner, if I, if I uh, mm -hmm. remember correctly. That's he also is. a very dark painting. It's quite uh, unluminescent. And I'd say, from what I recall of my reading of the, your translations of uh, Yang's narrative poem, it's pretty murky itself. And yet, he's a cheer he's, he seems to be a very cheerful dude. So um, do words like optimist and pessimist apply to um, Yang Lian's work at all? Or is that kind of not a helpful frame to be looking well, at? Well, I had a different answer in my mind. But as you were speaking, I thought of the Tai Chi too, you know, the diagram, the yin-yang diagram. Mm -hmm. And, you know, classically in, in pre-modern China, Optimism is, 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 is an extreme, pessimism is an extreme, and you don't want an extreme. You right. want a balance. You of want course. to reflect both sides. So the, 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 you know, the, the fully realized human is both optimistic and pessimistic and neither, if you mm. see what I mean. Yeah, of course. It's a, it's a philosophical stance that goes way back to early China, long before Buddhism. You know, to oh, you've cut out. Are you going to come back? Hmm. I'm going to pause the recording. Due to the fact that the, the poetry is about the universe becoming conscious of itself. You, you, you cut out for about ah. maybe 30 seconds, and I should have taken a mental note what the last thing he said was. Uh, well, but let's go back to the Tai Chi too, the yin okay. yang diagram. Thank you. Um, uh, and some, a thing that goes way back before to native Taoism before the arrival of Buddhism um, is the notion of being part of the of nature and nature can only express itself the cosmos can only speak through humans because mm. we're the only part of the universe that has language right so the, the function of poetry is for the cosmos to speak to itself mm. uh, and phew, luminescence and its opposite are both important because that's part of the whole show so you have to, as Yang Lian said, we must go deeper. We must become larger. We, we, contain, we must contain multitudes. He was very influenced by Yeats, and right. he's looking for a kind of mature, mature wisdom here. Right. You know, I'd never thought of, I knew I knew about um, the kind of quote-unquote Eastern way of thinking about binaries being part of the same thing. Um, mm. I read, was it, when I was starting to learn about the world of learning beyond school. In my last year of high school, I picked up The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and there was it's a very big book, uh, oh, yeah. you know, small, small print, mm -hmm. um, small gaps between the lines. But mm -hmm. one bit that jumped out, mostly the experience of reading it was little sections jumping out at me. And there was a bit where he talked about the difference between Western binary thinking and the kind of yin yang model from, from China yeah. and Asia. And I thought, oh, yeah, this makes so much sense. This is common sense, actually. Mm -hmm. And despite having thought I'd absorbed that, I'd never applied it to optimism and pessimism. But that probably describes how most people operate, regardless of yeah. what they call themselves. There's also another issue there with regard to time. You know, the, uh, what the Arabs call, or the Muslims call, Umm al-Qatab, the, the people of the book, which is to mm. say the Judeo-Christian traditions and the Muslims. They all see time as having a beginning and an end. God created the world, the world will run until God ends it. It's mm. lin time is linear. Now, time is not linear in, non, in, in other cultures, mm. particularly since we're speaking of China. It's more like a spiral, you know, so that you may spiral between optimism and pessimism. It also maps neatly onto Hegel's dialectics, you know, thesis, antithesis, higher synthesis, mm. which produces an antithesis and so on. Um, you know, so there's all sorts of uh, stuff that Yang was steeped in, you know, as, as a child, he, he was, his father gave him a wonderful education. Yang never went to university. Universities were shut when he was that age. Right. So he was kind of homeschooled by his dad in a way. And he has an immense knowledge of classical literature and classical thinking. So that is 
relevant here when he's he's going back into um, the imperial age and the pre and pre modern thinking. He's also going back into his own childhood, <laughs> cool. which is what gives it power. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's relevant to, to narrative poem, going back into childhood. It, it is, yes, indeed, yeah. indeed, yeah. Next question. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, so this one we've, we've touched on a wee bit when you talked about oh. um, your friend, you and your brother Harvey's friendship with mm. young Leon, um, how you kind of introduced him to Scots or Scotland and it's uh, the, the quest to kind of bring back or preserve its uh, native culture mm-hmm. or language or, or what have you i just wonder specifically did yourself or harvey teach any scots to young Leanne over the years does he do you know if he's got any favorite scots phrases or terms or words? no 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 we didn't even try when i first when <laughs> i first started working with him uh, i got a phone call he'd been at a, a conference in berlin and i'd done some i'd done two or three of these poems for a magazine or for an anthology and the editor had showed them to uh, Yang, who had no English uh, to speak of, and Yang had shown them to some American poets uh, and, and compared them with other people's translations, and the American poets had said mine was the best. So Yang was living in Sydney, and he phoned me up. I was teaching, you know, and the secretary came and said, there's an urgent phone call. So I had to leave a class, I and mean, I thought somebody must have died, but there's this Beijing voice uh, saying, oh, that's a Jihang. <laughs> you know, you know, with that Beijing back in the throat voice, you know. and yeah. he said basically, uh, "I haven't got much time." He said, but "I'm flying back to Australia, but would you like to translate my collected shorter poems?" Mm. So, well, I mean, what would you say? Yeah, exactly. I said, "I f- fine, fine." So uh, we we actually corresponded. We d- we didn't meet for nearly three years, mm. uh, and then he said very little English, but. Um, that year we went, I introduced, I took him up to Harvey, we went for a long drive. Uh, Harvey was in Dumfries and Galloway. And, you know, it was a bit stiff, the first bottle, but the time the second bottle came, the poets were ignoring the rest of the people. And just, they were deep into things like meter and rhyme. And Harvey taught Yang how he could use rhyme. Because mm. Yang had thought rhyme was cliched, hackneyed, nothing to do with him. That was old stuff. But Harvey showed him how he could use it. And uh, Yang has been using rhyme more and more, which is, as you can imagine, a real problem for me. <laughs> right, because he's rhyming in Mandarin. <laughs> yes, which rhymes very easily, very thick, and it's like Italian. Mm. You know, so, no, we haven't bothered with Scots uh, yet, but Yang has absorbed ideas. You know? I mean, when mm. I first met him, he, he knew McDermott and Sorley McLean. Um, Hugh McDermott and Sorley McLean had been translated into Chinese because they were communists. Right. So, and in fact, uh, on a on a raised beach. Is it on a raised beach? Yes, that was an influence uh, on one of his poems. In the first book we did, um, Sky Burial, about you know the Tibetan habit of leaving bodies out to mm-hmm. uh, uh, to decay. Uh, as stones dream of these names, you know, and he talks about names melting like snow across the, the stones. Mm-hmm. Uh, imagining stones of consciousness and we so fleeting, which is taken directly from McDermott's poem on a, on a raised beach, which he admits. So there, <coughs> there has been some influence. Uh-huh. Next, que- next question. Next on, question. Let's get this going. <laughs> Marching swiftly on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's, <coughs> that's all the questions about Yang Lian. And we've kind of mm-hmm. caught a few glimpses as we've been talking of a narrative poem, his his. Mm-hmm. Big, great big poem slash book that is uh, our book for this episode. I think you mentioned a little essay that is is in my little list of questions that I read as as prep. It was quite an interesting one, and it was a it was a critical one. Although I'm going to leave out the critical points uh, and just just give you the or just read to the listeners the name of this essay, which is available uh, for free online. I'll put a link in the show notes uh, for listeners. Um, it's called Young Lien's Exilic Poetry: Colon World Poetry, Ghost Poetics and self dramatization so just going off the title we've got quite a lot of ways we could describe what n- narrative poem is or is not so my question for you is what does it have to do with if anything with exiledom in little quotes world poetry being a ghost which is not in quotes and the dramatization of one's life what's it got to do with those things or are they are well they how much time do how- how much time do we have? There's several PhDs in there. Well, time is uh, a spiral. I thought, so. <laughs> well, there we are. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was just going to make a joke about deja vu, but do, 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 I do. Thought, <laughs> no, 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 I've forgotten it already. Oh, okay. 
Right. Um, I thought it was an interesting little essay, and I, I don't disagree with it. Mm. Although it is very critical. Yeah. But I mean, these are three. These are themes that are very important for Yang. Um, the exile thing, that was one of the most important things to happen in his, his life. Mm. But he'd already been exiled before in an internal psychological sense. Mm -hmm. uh, his family, you know, his great-grandfather, for instance, was a moneylender to Manchu princes. And the family owned, um, I don't know, well, you know Beijing, but Wang Fujing, it's the Beijing yes. equivalent of uh, Oxford Street. His family mm -hmm. owned that. Right. Because they lent money to the Manchu princes to buy opium, and when the Manchu princes had no more money, they, they put, repossessed the property. So that was what Yang's family was. His grandfather, his grandmother, was a Mongol princess. Gosh. Um, so you know, he's he's aristocracy. Well, mm -hmm. he's not actually. He's he's rich. A very rich <laughs> family. But his parents were enthusiasts for the revolution, and they gave away all the property to the party. Right. Or, or they give away a lot of the personal property. The party, of course, um, expropriated much of the, the, you know, the, the land and the houses and the property and so on. So he's in exile from that background. All Chinese of my age, you know, who, who were young, well, I was born in the same year as the Chinese Revolution. So right. we're exiles in Yang's sense. We're exiles from, from imperial culture. Mm -hmm. He was exiled... Uh, uh, you know, as a child growing up in a family which was, especially as his teenage years, the, his father had a huge collection of, of classical music and a very, very uh, classy radio radiogram. Um, so he was surrounded by classical music, his uh, particular romantic stuff, Beethoven. Um, right. And also, so that made him an exile from his classmates. And then in his teenage years, he was sent down to the countryside, this vast movement that Mao started. So he was exiled from his home, from his parents, from his friends, and sent to dig graves in, you know, a remote mountain village, mm -hmm. um, a long way from Beijing, near, closer to Xi'an. Gosh. Uh, so he, um, you know, the, when Tiananmen happened in 1989, he was on uh, a trip to, he was visiting New Zealand for a year. Mm -hmm. John Minford, the, the great the great English translator, John Minford, who was then professor of Chinese at Auckland University, invited Yang. The two had met when Minford was uh, uh, first in China in the, in the mid early eighties. So you know they've known each other for a long time. But so Yang Yang was there, and then he and Gu Trung and Minford organised a memorial to the dead of Tiananmen, which meant he was immediately persona non grata. He could mm -hmm. not go home. So did the news and, travel very fast? Yeah, but I mean, for many years he could go home because uh, he had a New Zealand passport and it uh, said that, you know, it didn't have the characters for his name. So when he was right. filling in the entry forms, he just used different characters, a different, a different Yang and a different Lian. And right. that, worked, that worked for a long time. By the time the Chinese government had their computers up and running, he was no longer persona non grata. Huh? He, he was on a blacklist for a while, but by the time he moved to London, which would be what mid late nineties. Um, he met somebody in the embassy who said, "No, no, no, you're not on the blacklist anymore." There you so, go. You know, <laughs> so, uh, but exile is one of the really, really important things. It personally, you know, in his daily life, um, having to learn to live, and he's lived in New Zealand, Australia, London. Now he lives in Berlin now, mm -hmm. um, and he's travelled all over the world. But it's also one of his great themes, and in a way you would almost say, looking at his poetry and his thinking, that the exile was necessary. It was already there in, in the egg, as it were. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the actual fact of moving away. World poetry, of course, is a very important thing, because had it not been uh, for the, you know, the, the interest in the 80s and 90s in world poetry, in fact, the mm. invention of the concept, and Yang couldn't have done what yeah. he's done. Uh, as a ghost, well, that's another of his big themes. Right, it's not just this book. No, 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 no. I still haven't sorted out, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea of so much resonance that it runs through the whole idea, uh, the, you know, that it runs through all these books. Um, it's partly to do with this, this exile, that as a ghost from the other life looks back. So we um, alienated moderns, looking back at the riches of old China, uh, we're like ghosts and that we can no longer participate in the full richness of life. Mm -hmm. So the ghost is the eternal observer, the outsider. 
right. which is also which is also the poet's function. I mean, he models himself on Qi Yuan, um, the great well, the the guy who the poet, the first named poet in China, who drowned himself as a rebuke to his ruler, which is where the Dragon Boat Festival comes from. Mm-hmm. Uh, Qi Yan is a, it's in English the Songs of the South, right? Uh, translated by David Hawkes, you know, truths. Mm-hmm. So this idea of the poet as the eternal outsider speaking truth to a world that doesn't necessarily care to listen. That's part of the ghost thing as well. So these right. complex things of exile, being a ghost, Chu Yan, they're all tied up together. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, the dra- dramatization of, the, of life, well, what else does a poet do? Come on. Yes, <laughs> that, that is um, true. Um, I wonder... Although I suppose, in a, having said that, that's a very Western concept. You know, um, Wordsworth's concept of, of the poet as a man speaking to other men. Now, that doesn't happen in traditional Chinese culture because mm. poetry doesn't come out, although there are some early shamanic things, but the poetry doesn't come out of things like the um, divine inspiration in Greece and Rome where the god speaks through the poet. Um, so this is maybe more a pointer for the listeners. Uh, the only other episode... No, I've done two other episodes on poetry, although one, I'm not sure if it's strictly poetry. One's on uh, Lu Xun's um, Ye Cao Wild Grass, a.k.a. Weeds. Uh, and there's one which is on more definitely, it's definitely poetry. It's called The Wild Great Wall by Juju. And Juju is also, he's not strictly speaking in exile, but his poetry deals with themes of exile. Um, so I guess if listeners like Yang Lian, Juju might be a, a guy to look out for who writes on some similar themes. But yeah, now that that's off my mind, um, let's go to the next question, which is, of all things, about the, the contents page of narrative poem. Because when I opened up the book, obviously that's one of the first things I see. And I can tell there's a lot of, at least in the way it's ordered, there's a lot of structure to this book because it's not just a bilingual contents page. It's got a preface, part one. Within part one, there's photograph album one. Uh, Within photograph album one, there's canto one. And then that repeats. Then there's a part two, which is just as intricately structured. And yeah, so without me describing the entire contents page. Um, I, yeah, I could just tell there was an intricate structure going on here, and I just yeah. wanted to ask you why you think that is. Well, all, all his work is like that. I mean, when I first started translating him, I, mean, I have to say I didn't understand him, but I used to say to people, you know, what I translate what he says, what he means is his problem. Mm. But slowly I, be- I began to realise, I've written about this, that a lot of his poem, it, 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 it's like uh, mosaic, the little right. tessera of images that come together to form a much bigger image. And it's very carefully structured. But in the case of narrative poem, the, the Chinese edition has the photographs. They're, oh. uh, it's, it's a real photograph album. Right. But he wasn't able to provide them in time when the book went to press. Uh, I don't know why that's between him and the publisher. I wasn't part of the right, discussion. Right. The publisher didn't get them anyway. I don't know why. Didn't um, happen. Right. But the genuine photographs, and it's actually quite moving in the Chinese to see the original. Because so when he's describing um, in these sections, uh, for instance, uh, photograph album, uh, just flicking through it, the yeah, they were first day. Um, What's the page be- uh, page 37. 37, thank you. Yeah. So the, the little beast sleeps on its side. I mean, this is a photograph of the newborn Yang sleeping on his side. Oh. And it's actually a quite, a, a, you know, the, the, the white mittens, the, the cot, the snow. He was born in, uh, um, in Switzerland. Mm. But it was very snowy. His father was a diplomat. Right. So, you know, it's, it's actually what seems at first abstract there was a moment of epiphany many years ago, and well, not that many years ago, maybe 20 years ago. <laughs> Yang and I were at, were at a conference in Auckland, a wonderful week-long conference on egg, poets in exile, which was dominated by poets and writers rather than by the parasitic academics who write about poets and writers. Which critics, eh? Critics, yeah. Which Podcasters. Hold it. Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I mean, that's second order. So yeah, this yeah, one yeah, yeah. D- dominated by first order discussions. Mm-hmm. And at one point, the, the organiser took us out to his batch, you know, his little uh, out-of-town cottage, which l- 
and Yang came, Yang was a bit ahead of me. He went in the house first, I'm talking to somebody. He ran back, said, come here, Joe, look at this. And it was at the head of a valley, and as you look down on the skyline, you look down to a perfect V of 90 degrees, beyond which was the sea. You know, the, the hills sloped down green and the sea was that. And he said, look, that's the beginning of where the sea stands still. Blue is always higher. Now, I just assumed this was an abstract. But no, when you stand by the sea and you look at the sea, it does appear to rise, mm -hmm. you know, the curvature of the, of the earth and that. And that was where I thought, oh, wait a minute. It's like he's taking lots of wee snapshots and collaging them together. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with the structure. Um, many of his books are like narrative poem and where the sea stands still and anniversary snow. They're, they're concentric circles. They're full length. They're book length poems. Right. In his thinking. Got it. So yes, yeah, it's structured. And I'm not going to read, I'm going to read you Peking Opera lesson. Okay. Because, which is definitely my favourite. Fantastic. And there, are lots of, there are lots of references to the theatres, which were all owned by his family. Mm. His, his, his father is a, an aficionado of uh, both Western opera and, and Peking opera. Uh, I'm not going to read it in Chinese because my accent is awful. Okay, but fair it, enough. It's Jing Ju Ko. It's Peking Opera, Jingju. Jingju Ko. 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 Peking Opera lesson. And this, these are images of, you have to imagine the, the, the Peking Opera stage. If you've ever been to um, the, uh, the Summer Palace on the fringes of, of Beijing. I took my mum Beautiful there. stage. Ah, well, there's a, there's a lovely stage there. That's, imagine that. Mm. And of course, there's also underlying it, there's a lot of flower stuff, which is because in classical Chinese, hua, meaning a flower, can also mean a beautiful girl. Mm. So, Peking Opera Lesson. Peonies cluster round. On their fine stamens stand pergola and patio. Her cheek transits over to him. A dream half white, half red. His sweet tenderness becomes her springtime soprano. Is man, is ghost, an impossible beauty dallies with the world beyond. Dalliance approaching. Powder's perfume shores up the aroma of flesh. Hip swinging, high buskins wade the riffling pool and see it overflow. He sings and she puts her signature to each drawn out end rhyme. Life is like theatre, but not everyone puts on a brilliant show, says father. Eastern Peace Market, Fortuna Theatre, Goldfish Lane, all chasing the king's concubine. Clouds want clothes, flowers want faces, history wants broken down relics that follow after grease paint is gone. He and she, Amorous looks and sweet ogling fill in the blank storyline. White silk sleeves have been rippling a millennium. Who cares about dry names? The shot glass is filled up all unseen, is knocked back all unseen. The snapped neck hanging from the strap in a darkened private party pirouettes. A true cut flower has encountered a true maturity, says father. A world hidden in air materialises with the crane's cries. Oh, dynasties, the crimson and the white are bliss indeed. An aria forced from deep in the throat forces out deep time's metamorphosis. Always the same story. Always this girl and this boy treading the margin of the stage as if it were the margin of time, treading the knife edge of the now. The oceans below the cliff recede. She and he watch us from a great height, the only extreme elegance allowed. Oh, how golden shines art's alembic. It pierces every silence in the ears, says father. And there you are. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for that. <laughs>
well, I've done it before. Right. <laughs> um, I just want to say one thing um, yeah. uh, before we skip on past narrative poem. Uh, it was really interesting uh, finding out that there were um, pictures to each of these little uh, descriptions yeah. of the pictures, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I This is one for, again, maybe more for the listeners, anyone who's um, following me on Twitter or doesn't follow me on Twitter yet. I took a picture of the front cover narrative poem and was going to write some clever comment, but instead I just put another picture up next to it, which is a meme, one of these funny pictures uh, from the internet. And it's um, it's a guy whose face has been distorted in like a fisheye effect. So he's he's leaning in and frowning and going, hmm, it's, it's the main character from the TV show, The Witcher, and he just looks totally befuddled. And it, it looks like he's looking at narrative poem. And I thought, is, is anyone going to get this little joke? It seems completely obscure and silly but there i got a reply from a scots chinese poet uh called j g ying who's on twitter quite a lot oh, yes. I've, I've met j mm-hmm. right he's good. He's good yeah he's a yeah. good guy uh well wh- wh- what did he say he said something like where is it click 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 he said this made me laugh i know what you mean so <laughs> i must have been onto something um, yeah yeah I should say, by the way, that, um, you know, Gao Xingjian and Yang have been friends for many years, and Yang chooses the covers for the books, not me. Right. It is a very nice cover, and it, um, the red yeah. text goes nicely on the kind of murky yeah. green paint. Yeah. Anyway, let's march on. Um, Let us? Mm-hmm. Yes. Let's wander away a wee bit from purely Chinese to English translation, which is what pretty much every episode of the show except the one I did on the Moss Flow has been about and towards a tongue that you and I might call one of our own but which most of those listening to us would not and that's obviously Scots. So the reason we're doing this show is you listened or you caught word of the episode on the Moss Flow and you emailed me and you said a few nice things and you also said your Scots leaves a little bit to be desired which is definitely true especially in my readings of the Moss Flow. Um, but I'm just curious, uh, apart from me botching some of the Scots words, um, is there anything else about uh, the Moss Flow that I just completely missed or got wrong that you'd like to kind of comment on? Well, it's the Moss Flow. Oh, of course. <laughs> Moss Flow. <laughs> Obviously. But, you know, the, and, yeah, I mean, I don't like this idea about botching. Uh, I mean, yeah, right. you know, you, you were working out of a... Well, obviously, I wasn't taught Scots. Right. I wasn't taught to read and write in Scots until uh, my third year at high school when I had Gallifield Fields Academy. Donald McInnes was probably the only teacher in Scotland who was making us read Scots for our hire, as well right. as, uh, every, of course, they, I, I missed the first two years. I was at school in Falkirk or in Larbert, uh, so I didn't get the Walter Scott. They were dozed mm. full of water pump full of Walter Scott for two years. But then for hire, we read from the Mackers, the medieval, great medieval poets like Henderson Dunbar, right up to poets who were still living, like Hugh McDermott. Right. Uh, and I, it was a wonderful education. But I had to teach myself. Mm. Because in Scotland, people outside that don't realise this probably, we are illiterate in our mother tongue. 70% of people in lowland Scotland speak Scots. But very, very few of them read and write it. We right. are taught to read and write in a foreign language, in English. Mm-hmm. Now, when you, uh, I just recently, just yesterday, replied to a friend, a translator, who posted something, uh, a very interesting story about one teacher who succeeded in preserving the Tibetan language across the area, and uh, a whole area of Tibet where the Chinese in the 50s and 60s were trying to stamp it out, mm. which they're still trying to do. And... I said, well, this is what happens when you're a minority language speaker, but we never see Scots on television, certainly if you're a borderer. The only Scots you see is in comedy programmes, and they're all from Glasgow, or occasionally Dundee. Right. So you know, our voice is not heard. So I'm not going to say you botch things because you're for Dundee. It's a different dialect. There's, there are, depending on how you count, six or seven dialects right. of Scots. Yeah. From the, I... the Northern Isles to Northern Ireland. And I'm... As, Speak Southern Scots, which is no the same again. Right. I'm going. I'm going to the two S are going him. And what would you say? In Dundee, you're going uh, him. Gone. Gone him. Gone home. Aye. Yeah. Gone him. Yeah. Aye. Could he do a pie? And you say El El Oh, is this about pies? 
Yes. Okay, we have a very good one in Dundee. Uh, so pi is a pair. And el her, el one, her well, what El her pair, yeah. But huh? also, if you want to really go for it and get some poetic rhyming, uh, toi, el he, toi pairs and ninging and ah, which means oh. two pies and an onion roll as well, please. And an ninging and an ah. Well, you know, St. Andrew's wonderful, wonderful album from the 90s, uh, The Word on the Pavey. I don't. It, Oh, oh, listen, you, you, but this guy who's a lecturer in Dun, Dun, Duncan and Jordanson, um, right. he, he performs as St. Andrew, and his the music was uh, Michael Mara, did the music. It's You get things like hip-hop and Dundee dialect. Oh, my goodness. Well, I bet the, the chorus is, well, I'd better chap a plane in and an ing in and an ah. Uh, yeah, that and could the, sound good to a beat. And suppose. the heavenly chorus, if you think Walk of the Wild Side, Lou Reed, and the, the chorus of female voices comes in, <laughs> oh, you need to, you need to ken about this boy. This his is, his yeah. second album has the secret Commonwealth of Elvis fans on it. Oh, and it is broad. The Swales I have trouble understanding them. Mm. It was a weird the, thing. Word, the word on the PV. Yeah, I wonder. If, so this is rambling a bit too much. I'll tell us yeah. as concisely as I can. Yeah. Me and my girlfriend were getting the bus uh, back from St Andrew, well, back from Dundee City Centre to Broughty Ferry, which is the suburb of Dundee I'm from. And there was a guy. Speaking of the secret Commonwealth of Elvis fans, mm-hmm. there was a guy sat at the front of the top deck of the bus um, who had. Uh, I think he was like in an audio. What would you call it? Like he was on a call on his phone and he had his headphones in mm-hmm. and was talking to his microphone and he was singing Elvis because at first. <laughs> At first, we thought he was singing to himself, but he was like, between songs, he was chatting to some other people who, from, from what we gleaned, might be singing along with him. So I wonder if that was a member of the Secret <laughs> Commonwealth operating in Dundee. Well, you never, you never can. Synchronicity. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to Chinese things. Um, well, I mean, just a very quick story. When I started mm. uh, doing the most flight, um, I, I fell in love with the book when I was a student, and I tried mm. to translate it in English, and I couldn't make it work. And my, my wife, my first wife, she said to me, look, you spent years reading in Scots, try it, try it in Scots. I said, well, I can't, I've never, ri-. you know, I'd never written in Scots. Mm. But then I sat down and the first thing just fell off the page. I, mean, I amazed myself. I didn't, I didn't again, I could do that. Mm. Um, so we have passive knowledge and it's about language learning. You have to learn your own language. Right, Your, the the mother tongue, you know, mm. we're r- reduced to just a passive thing, except in certain contexts. Right, you know, exactly. If you're a, if you're in the pub or a football match or we're talking to your granny or whatever. Right, right. So moving on. Okay, uh, one thing, quick thing, I'll say to that, then I will move on. I won't give you a chance to reply. Um, mm-hmm. So I was talk before we hit record. I was talking a wee bit about doing some like work experience editing of books in Scots, mm. and I found yeah, I could the text I was given, I could read it all fine. But one of my jobs was I thought to like standardize the spelling, which uh-huh. required an awful lot of thought because I didn't really know what the spellings were. And the conclusion I came to is there are many ways I could spell this. I'm just going to come up with my own spelling grid. Then I asked some other uh, publishers, proper publishers, uh, 404 Inc., who've done, amongst other things, they did Chris McQueer, who's like a young kind of Mm. Irving Welsh sort of figure. I asked him, and then I asked the publishers, like, how did you guys standardize the spellings? And uh, the publisher said, we didn't, you don't standardize Scots. And Chris McQueer said, well, I had help with an editor. And I said, oh, was your editor a Scots editor? He's like, no, it was an English guy. He was really helpful, though. He gave me some great writing feedback. so all, all these things I just had never considered because although I'd been taught to read Burns and whatnot in school, actually writing it, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, no. Right, marching on. So um, mm-hmm. you've, you've said before that getting to write, well, you said a minute ago, um, that your way to translate the Moss Flow, which if, if anyone who didn't listen to that episode is wondering, it's a Scots translation of uh, Water Margin, Shui Hu Juan. Um, your way of doing that was using Scots. And you've got other, I've got a book of your uh, translations called Ston and Malin, um, which is kind of like a trilingual book of Scots, uh, English and Chinese ancient poems. And it says in there, I think in your preface or your afterward, the English is there as a reference. The real thing that you're buying the book for, so to speak, is the Scots. So mm-hmm. I, I want to ask you, what is f- for you the affinity f- between Chinese, be it modern or ancient and Scots? Or if this is a more helpful way to phrase the question, what can Chinese to Scots, C to S, do that Chinese to English, C to E, uh, can't? 
Well, just in, in everything else, if, if you ask a translator a question, the answer is usually it depends. The, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, obviously, as, as native speakers for us, the Scots has echoes and resonances that it doesn't for others. Mm. But then you see the Chinese has echoes and resonances for Chinese speakers. Right. You know? um, so it's, it's, hard. It's, it's, it's an unconscious thing. But for me, the Scots has got power. It has energy. Kafka said that for him, as a Jew, um, German was always somebody else's language. And I, when I started to write in Scots, it was so liberating because I suddenly realized this is my language. Mm. It's my, my own tongue. It was my mother tongue. It was my mother's tongue, my granny's tongue, and all the rest of it. And we're speaking to ourselves. Mm. No, an, inter- an international audience is wonderful. That's great. And I can speak English for international purposes. But there's a large part of us that we didn't get to talk to each other mm. because the mass media didn't hear Scots. We can't hear Scots on the media. Yeah. So I have to use this. And it liberates me. Um, I love the music of it. It's a mm. different music to English. Um, it's, it's rhythmically different, or grammatically different. You know, Scots and English are you know, like maybe Spanish and Portuguese or Norwegian and, and, and Danish right. or Mand- Mandarin, Cantonese. Historically, well, Scots is a, is a West Germanic language like English. Right. But en- English came from the Midland dialect of Anglo-Saxon and Scots from the Northern dialect. Mm-hmm. So they're historically related, but they're not the same. One is not a dialect of the other. They're both dialects of Anglo-Saxon. Right. You know? That's a but, definition I've come across. I think mm-hmm. maybe because a person uh, is explaining to me and not a paragraph online. <laughs> well, maybe I, but <sighs> there isn't a big universal one size fits all to answer the question of what can Scots do that English can? Right. Because it depends on the communication. If, if there isn't a speaker and a listener or a writer and a reader, then that closed, uh, you don't get that circuit, like an electrical circuit closing and sparking up. Uh, it's mm-hmm. about interaction. And I mean, I've had such a uh, lot of positive feedback from that book, Stan in Malane. You know, folk, folk just love it. Uh, it, it. It opened up something in myself. And mm. also, particularly, I mean, you, you've chosen to, to talk about one poem by Li Bai, right. which in Chinese is called Jiang Jin Zhou. Jiang Jin Zhou, right. Alliteration, you notice? Now, in, in, right. When in his day in the eighth century, it was probably around something like Tian Xin as right. far as we can tell, but it still alliterates. Mm. Now, in Scots, we have the wonderful adverb ben. Now, Jiang means take or bring, Jin means into or mm. in, Jiu is alcohol. So, bring the bevy ben. Jiang, bring, uh, Jin, ben. Bring Ben Bevy would be even more. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Bring Ben Bevy. <laughs> Um, and but then, yeah. you know, so you, the, it's it's like if, if you're an artist and you move from oils to acrylics, there are some effects you can get in one that you can't get in others. Mm-hmm. Or if, you know, if you transcribe a, a Bach lute piece for the piano, it's the right. same thing. The notes are the same. Just well, that's that's translation. You know, the images are the same, but the words are different. Yeah. And, Hopefully, the emotional engineering that goes behind it works. And yeah. Levi, Levi was very colloquial. He liked ballad forms, you know, old-fashioned forms. He wasn't a great innovator in form. Mm-hmm. Would you like to hear it? Would you like to hear it? That would be lovely. I was trying to think of a, another metaphor about what you're saying about how the same thing can come out in different ways. And my idiot yeah. brain could only come up with, if you put different color codes through different printers, you get slightly different shades of color. But I think that's actually a terrible metaphor. Um, so bad. Oh, I tell you what. Piece of advice: Go to the preface to the um, the King James Bible, the 1610 preface. Yeah, it's a wonderful passage there. Translation it is, which uh, draweth back the curtain and letteth in the light, something like that. You know, right. it opens the shell that we may eat the nut. There's a whole series of metaphors. You'd like that. Mm, fantastic. Um, right. So I was wondering if we could get. Um, some kind of reading of two of these three languages that bring the bevy bends in. Um, I was wondering, would you like to do this, the Scots, and I could do the English parallel by some means? Certainly. I thought I would begin by reading the first part of it in Chinese, just the first few lines, just to Fantastic. get a feeling for the sound of it. Okay, okay. so 
the poet, the poet is Li Bai, eighth century Tang Dynasty, one of the, one of the great, if not the greatest poet. Jiang Jin Zhou, Jun Bu Jian, Huang He Zhi Shui, Tian Shang Lai, Ben Liu Dao Hai, Bu Fu Hui, Jin Bu Jian, Gao Tang Ming Jing Dei Bai Fa, Zhao Ru Qing Si, Mu Cheng Xue, Ren Sheng De Yi, Xu Jin Huan. And there we are, it's just a random Fantastic. selection. Uh, that was great to listen to. The um, music I use as the outro for this podcast is a song, it's called Zai Jian uh, which is referring to Jack, Goodbye Jack Kerouac. It's by a oh. band called Tongyang from Beijing. And on that album, uh, they're kind of the band itself's moving away from what would you call it, like turn of the millennium alt metal to more like kind of drawing back into like Chinese folk or poetry uh -huh. traditions. And actually, you sounded a little bit like the singer on some of the songs where he's going for a more poetic sound than just singing a rock song. Um, I, sound, I sounded a bit like Yang Lian as well. I was going to say that as well, yeah. You, um, if you touch pitch, you shall be defiled therewith. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how would you like to do this? Would you like to read well, all, bring the baby back? No, or would you like to do that, verse that, by verse? Two, verse by verse, couplet by couplet. Okay. That, that, that would be easier for the listener. Right? Okay, and I'll preface this all by saying, Poetry is not really my area of expertise, so I'll just wow. do my best. Just very colloquial, be natural. You know, yeah. Just like you're on the phone. Mm -hmm. Bring the bevy ben, which is? Bring in the booze. Oh, sirs, have you no seen the muckle yelly wetter get round into the sea, coming back never? Oh, sirs, have you never seen the great yellow river go rolling down to the sea, coming back never? Oh, sirs. Have you no seen the keeking glasses in the bricht hall ruin this morning's jet black hair that's new as white as snow? Oh, sirs, have you never seen the mirrors in the bright hall ruin this morning's black hair that's now as white as snow? In this life, gin right vogue ye would be, man, dinny lee your gowden tassie, tim my blood em in. In this life, if you do it stylishly, man, don't leave your golden goblet empty beneath the moon. I used my high engine for heaven a bin. Thousands in gold I've spent that'll no come back in. I use my great intelligence from heaven above. Thousands in gold I've spent that won't come back soon. Roast ye yows and slaughter out for grand fun. It'll take 300 rams to mark the ye sederant. Roast ewes and slaughter cattle for big fun. I'll take 300 glasses to make one proper sitting. Be ye old buddich or be ye bold callant, bring the bevy ben and keep it coming. Be ye old geezer or be ye bold young gallant, bring in the booze and keep it coming. I'll sing ye a song, sirs, and it please ye. Say lend us your lugs and tack ten to me. I'll sing you a song, sirs, if it pleases you. So lend me your ears and take notice of me. What's the avail? Your utter fine quaith, your gem stain, all you wants to be forever foo and ne'er be fresh again. What's your precious silver cups, your gemstones worth? All you want is to be forever sloshed and never sober again. The long sign saints and sages were torn faced, elka yin, for by the drinkers there nae others left a good name. Saints and sages on the past were glum and gloomy, every one. Except for the drinkers, no others left behind a good name. The King of Trin ranted through the peace for pleasance, read wood for pleasure, pouring drams by the millions. The King of Chen ranted through the peaceful pleasance, pure mad for pleasure, pouring drinks by the millions. Good man, what do we mean you're short to sell her? I'll get a rune in, sir, and drink with ye in stanter. Landlord, what do you mean that you're short of money? I'll buy you a round and drink with you right away. My pirate navy, my costly sable coatie, guard the boy, lay them in wide for a swally, and together we'll guard lang ages ado, sant clean of all. My brindled horse, my costly sable mantle, 
get the boy to pawn them for a few drinks, and together we'll make long ages of woe vanish clean away. Oh, very good. Well that done, was fun. you. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yeah, I was actually, another thing I meant to say when I was saying about how it was a bit of an eye-opener for me editing Scots slash mm. trying to standardize its spelling, however mm. futile or not that is, um, how much more I understood your poems in Stone and Malane when I was reading them aloud, um, befuddling right. my English girlfriend um, yep. Yep. rather than just that's trying it. to read them in my head. Yeah. Well, you see, that's it. We're speakers, but we're, we're illiterate, essentially. Mm. You know, literacy involves uh, reading in your head. Yeah. Right. Next, next, next. Yep. Okay. So we've got some miscellaneous questions. Mm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've, um, a few Chinese voc- vocab words have, have popped up. Um, Meng Long was the one that stuck in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wondering, as a thing I try to do on every episode and occasionally forget, is a, a Chinese word of the day for, for listeners, mm-hmm. whether they are amazing at Chinese or whether they barely know a few words. I think it's a fun thing. Um, so could you suggest a Mandarin Chinese word of yeah. the day and maybe one that Yang Lian um, would pair with nicely. Well, it relates to Yang Lian in that it's part of a concept that is absolutely absent in Western culture. Mm, perfect. Well, until until it was until there was cross fertilization, of course. Right. But if you write a man and put that behind the, gl- the glyph for a mountain, you get in classical Chinese xian or mm. modern Chinese xian ren, a xian person. Mm. Now, Chinese people will insist on in translating xian as fairy. Right. It's not. It's not. Absolutely not. Uh, fairies were a separate order of creation. To think that that works is to f- completely misunderstand the function, history, and structure of fairies in Western culture. Right. <clears throat> there were three orders of creation angels, humans, and fairies. Mm. Now, Xianren are human. Now, Xianren, now, <coughs> excuse me, I'm quoting from uh, Paul Kroll's. Students' Dictionary of Classical and Medieval Chinese. It's a great definition. Okay. It's a Taoist term, a transcendent being, one who has beyond, moved beyond the needs and limits of the mundane world into the realm of spiritualization or divinity. Though extraordinarily long-lived, a sien is not immortal. So, how do you become sien? Sien. <coughs> Excuse me. A <coughs> sien ren. It's about the Taoist thing of immersing yourself in the natural flow of things, doing nothing unnatural, mm-hmm. becoming, uh, becoming, becoming one with everything around you, with the 10,000 phenomena. And you do that through meditation exercises, through Tai Chi, things like the Tai Chi mm-hmm. uh, exercises, meditation, living in the mountains because the Qi the energy, the vital energy, qi, is what makes dead things different from living things. Living things happy. Right. Dead things don't. But you live in the mountains because the qi is stronger there. And right. you live your life with this end point of purification. You may grow wings. Well, that's unlikely nowadays, but 2,000 no. years ago, <laughs> 2,000 years ago, they thought it might be possible. You may end up living on a diet of spring water and, and pine nuts because that's perfect purity. Mm. And it suited the Yang Lian because Yang Lian dives deep into his own culture, like a, you know, fishing for pearls, and he brings up these strange, monstrous things from the deep, or they're strange and monstrous to me, because mm. I don't dive in these waters. And that's a perfect example of an, a near untranslatable uh, mm. concept, Xian Ren. In, um, right. tradition, or conventionally it's been translated as immortal but as Kroll points out these guys aren't immortal no. they may be transcendent they may be perfected uh-huh. um, but they're human it's just the same thing you know the, like the Buddha the Lord Buddha Gautama was a human he wasn't a god he didn't become a god he just showed us the pathway by which humans can become who they really are mm-hmm. Now, it's probably I, the same thing. Yeah, I know we we're trying to avoid rambling and going on tangents, but mm-hmm. when you were saying about the mistranslation of Xian to um, mm-hmm. fairy, this is something mm-hmm. that really um, caught my attention. When I did, uh, I did an episode on uh, San Mao's Stories of the Sahara, Sahala de Gusha, which has yeah. been brought out mm-hmm. to English by Mike Fu, who was a guest on, mm-hmm. uh, a guest on that episode uh, for listeners who want to check that out. And I asked him about... about uh, Bixian, um, 
pen mm-hmm. spirit, or mm-hmm. as I was introduced to it, pen fairy. Although I was pretty aware fairy was not the mm. not the exact right <laughs> word, but the fact that it wasn't the right word made it more interesting to me because it sounded, I don't know, it just caught really caught my little imagination. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, it's a it's like Yang Lian talks about Ezra Pound's translations. He talks about Pound's magnificent mistakes. Right. Sometimes, sometimes mistranslations can be much more fertile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think it it caught my attention much more than the the listener who was telling me about it. Basically, BCN Pen Fairy, something a little bit like it's like a Chinese e- equivalent or parallel to Ouija board. And there was a yeah. thing fans of Sam Mao did where they tried to speak to her or her husband Jose through mm-hmm. the, the the Pen Fairy, the spirit pen. But I, I could go on and on about that. But just to say, it's nice to see uh, Xian from Bixian coming back to the podcast. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is I had a neighbor who lived next to my mom who lived to 105 and was one of the most lovely, chilled out guys I ever knew. He was just a fellow Dundonian. But you, the correct description you were giving me there of a like a transcended um, Xian Ren sounds a lot mm-hmm. like my neighbor Alf. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Obviously. just a final a final point before we move on. Um, and these days of lockdown, do we need the Ouija board to talk to people in Glasgow? <laughs> That's what I've been doing. Don't know about you. <laughs> right, next, moving on. Moving on. Um, okay, so maybe this relates a little bit to the word of the day. And again, this mm-hmm. this is totally an, an indulgent rambling question. Mm-hmm. So when I was doing the moss flow not Moss Flow. Mm-hmm. Good man. Thanks, Thank my boy. I'm learning. Always a student. <laughs> um, I was trying to learn a little bit about yourself through the internet. I think mm-hmm. it was through YouTube <clears throat> I learned about the existence of uh, the Kagyu, sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, the Kagyu Samya Tibetan Buddhist Monastery. I think because mm-hmm. there was a video of you and Yang Lian paying tribute to your brother Harvey and the same account mm-hmm. had some videos of this monastery. And mm-hmm. there's Maybe I'm drawing connections where they aren't there, but there's a picture of yourself on the back of Stone and Malin, and it looks like you might be somewhere a bit like that. I don't know if you're sat in the monastery. Oh, no, uh, no, although I, I know Samuel Ling very well. Right. But, uh, that, that photograph was taken in uh, West China, Sichuan province, oh, right. <clears throat> in an area of which um, Zhou Jai Go, it's a, what, what they call it, UNESCO uh, thing. Uh, protected area. Right. But, uh, it used to be Tibet, but they they, they, they withdrew, they, they redrew the boundaries. That was right. taken there. But no, Sammy Ling, I went up there first in the '67, I think. Um, oh right, it's quite old. Yeah. Well, what these the first two, there were two monks sent to London in the early '60s from Tibet because there is a prophecy that, um, or there was a, long ago, there's a prophecy that um, Buddhism would decline in Tibet but flourish in the West. Interesting. Where it lands to the west, you know. So two guys landed up um, in uh, Akong Rinpoche and Chogyan Trumpa Rinpoche. Uh, they ended up in uh, London and they met a family who had inherited a house and land in Estil, near Estil Muir, up the top of the southern uplands, right. which is the wettest parish in Scotland, incidentally. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yes. Um, and the family said, well, we'd, we've got no use for it. You take it. So they set up a monastery there. And they've since built their own, you know, they've, they've built, as you, as you drive up the hill, winding road through the forestry plantations, you come round the corner and above the, the spruces, there is this Tibetan tower with upturned leaves and the eyes painted on it. That's amazing. It is. It's astonishing. It's a lovely place. It's a, a very important centre for the well, for the Dharma, of course, but also for Tibetan painting and Tibetan medicine. It's mm. a world worldwide importance, um, right? And it's you know it's it's not easy to get to from here from Melrose. It would be a, probably about an hour and a half, I would think, mm-hmm. drive. But it's the heart of the Southern Uplands. The parish of Estill Muir first comes on record in Melrose Abbey. Uh, 12, early 12th century uh, rent rolls from Melrose Abbey, which uh, the the land up there belonged to the Abbey. So it's interesting. The first record is monastic. Mm. And a thousand years later, there's another monastic thing going on up there. Right. I guess I it's, a, good... it's, it's, a, it's a lovely place. And when this lockdown is over, you know, I would recommend that you come down and we'll take a jaunt. Yeah, uh, I would take you up on that, I think. 
Um, mm -hmm. yeah, fantastic. And, here, and here's a, a, a funny little story. Yeah, um, you like those. <laughs> I was, uh, some years ago, five, six years ago, I, I, I applied for and got a residency in the Vermont Studio Center. Um, to, right. it's, it was a scholarship that ran for a few years uh, that paid for Chinese poets and translators to come and work together for a month. I think this and is where the poet Juju went, the one I mentioned earlier. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, apparently the money has run out. Oh. Uh, but the first time I did it, Yang Lien, um we were going to go together. Uh, and, and Yang said, he kept, I said, have you done it yet? Have you applied yet? No, it is, he had to apply. No, I'm, I'm busy with this. I'll do it next. And the deadline got nearer and nearer. I said, listen, do it. You'll get this. Just do it. Oh, well, it's all right. And then the deadline's coming close. And they said, no, no, it's all right. They'll take a late application. And I actually cut and pasted from the website. We do not accept late applications. Oh. And he emailed me back. He said, oh, but they'll take one from me. Mm. Which I'm so famous and wonderful, you know. And of course, they didn't. Mm. So I landed up without a poet. And it happened there was a Chinese poet who didn't read the rules. Chinese people never read the instructions, you know. I noticed that when I was living there. <laughs> you, know, you remember Trabudo? Trabudo, yep, right. Near enough. It's near enough. Mm -hmm. they're, they're like the Irish, you know. Ah, sure, it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. So they ended up with a, a loose translator, a loose poet. They turned out to be a lovely man. Mm. Um, uh, his name just escapes me, but um, we went into you know, the guy who founded the place who retired from running it, but he had a painter, a big studio, and he invited us to his studio after lunch one day. And we got in, and it was a barn, basically. Mm. And right. right from the length of it, which must be about 30 feet away, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Anyway, the the poet roared out, look, that's my guru. He didn't speak any English, so I had to translate this. And there was right. a picture of, of uh, Chogyam Trumpa, one of the founders of Sam Yeling. Oh. Who it turned out, after a few years at um, S.D.L. Muir, uh, they were left, an American gave them some land in Vermont, not 20 miles away from where we were. And the, the painter had studied meditation with this guy. And... Uh, the the poet had known him when he was in Tibet, so we had this odd link up. Right, That's and very... I knew this about three weeks before Akon Grimpoche, who the co-founder, uh, was murdered. Huh. He was taking a large sum of money for his his charity to Tibet, and he was killed in a hotel room in Sichuan. Jesus. Well, I mean, some people, well, Tibetans, some people allege that it was the secret police that did it, but we'll never know. Right. Uh, so, you know, we had this, because I knew I called Rinpoche. So there were the three of us standing there in America uh, with a mm. strange connection through Samuel Lin. Well, that is, that's funny. I, I just Googled um, Juju and Dong Li, the poet and translator that I did on the show. And yeah, sure enough, it was the exact same studio. So Vermont Studio Center, lovely place, lovely yeah. place. So we've I'd come full circle back. in a way there. We have indeed, yes. Yeah. So next question. Next question. So these are the, the last few questions. Um, because um, I'm getting hungry. I want to make my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now you've incepted that idea in my head. Now I'm thinking about a sandwich. Mm. Uh, oh, well, I was, I was thinking about baking an onion or something. Nice. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, yeah. Um, so a little self-promo moment. Um, are you working on any of your own projects just now in, in lockdown? And... Are there any other like works or platforms already out there you'd like to take the opportunity to promote and point listeners towards? Well, there's um, right at the moment, I am just finishing off a book proposal for a very, very big project. Mm. I can't tell you more than that, but it's a very big publisher. It's very prestigious. It'll be four years of work. Gosh. It's, it's the complete works of a Chinese poet, uh, okay. a classical one, a classical one. Uh, right. So I'm writing the book proposal for that. I'm still just finishing off the latest. But Yang is now, a few years ago, I said to Yang, we were having a drink, we'd been doing a reading, and I said, you know, are you finished the new book? He said, no, 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 no. I said, well, don't wait until you finish it, because if you wait till you finish it, you send it to me, it takes me two, three years to translate it. Why don't you send it in installments? And he went, oh, what a good idea. 
So mm -hmm. I've had the latest installments. I've about twenty poems, so okay. just about just about finished doing that. And then I don't know what. Maybe he'll send me some more. And in recent months, I've been actually quite concentrating a lot. I've been doing a fair bit of uh, translation of classical poetry, the mm -hmm. poet called Bai Jui, Tang okay. poet, uh, which is not ready for publication. But I've also been um, recording my first album, my first solo album. Oh, cool which is Border uh, Songs and Tunes. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's stalled, not just with lockdown, but other things have been happening. It's stalled like 99%, 99% done, just the final mastering to be done. And right. So uh, I'm hoping that, I don't know what's going to happen uh, with the lockdown and everything, but mm. that's a big thing for me. I'm very pleased to do that. Right. Well, so um, look out for it's going to be called Hassan's Dream. Hassan's Hass Dream. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I do a little news segment at the start of every episode, so I'll mm. keep an eye out for those. Or if 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 you want mm. to get it on the news segment, that me an email, and I'll make sure any any of those, even if it's the album, doesn't matter if it's not mm. anything to do with Chinese. You're a former guest of the show, so I gladly stick that in the news for the listeners who are interested. Thank you very much. So I have I have Glancy in the land of podcasts. And... There you go. Yeah, <laughs> the first of many uh, packets or whatever uh, measurements mm. you used to measure Glancy. Yeah, um, <laughs> buckets. Buckets. Your first bucket of podcast Glancy. A, a, a pale fair Glancy, please. <laughs> A pun and a half. That'll do it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pun and a guanche. Um, I should I should try and translate some uh, Dundonian into Chinese or vice versa. That would be funny. I did it do. I did find a guy um, on on a Dundonian on WeChat, um, and we we were messing. He was very fluent in in Chinese, and we're having fun rendering like modern Scots, mostly rude words as Chinese characters, <laughs> but I won't repeat any of that, I'm sure. It was, oh yeah, dober, oh yeah, dwoba, or something. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, so you can have fun. It's called, I mean, there's a verse form for that, it's called macaronics, where you write a verse, you write a, a poem in different languages. Hmm. So it's very similar. But yes, and <laughs> vulgarity is always a good thing. Yes, I'll, yes. I'm always for that. <laughs> Yeah, so a, right couple, a couple more rounding off questions. Mm -hmm. um, if listeners read narrative poem or if they just enjoyed your reading of uh, Beijing Opera, uh, where else would you point them? And it could be any book, it doesn't have to be anything related to oh, Chinese. Well, of course, I think I, I can't, I've actually lost count. I think I've done 19 books with Yang Lian, so there's plenty of Yang Lian there. Yeah. Um, for the wider contemporary music scene, I'm just, sorry, poetry scene in China. Uh, few, 2012, I think, uh, the Blood Axe anthology, Jade Ladder. Oh, yeah. I, I was poet, translation editor. And, and, but uh, Jade Ladder. <laughs> Jade Ladder is a, it's a good spread of, uh, in translation of, of uh, what was being written 10 years, 10 years ago. Right, Jade Ladder. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. That is where our listeners can find more um, modern Chinese poetry. And in terms, of, in terms, in terms, in terms of Scots, just read everything. Oh, thanks. Absolutely. Oh, and, mm -hmm. and, and um, yeah. Oh, and. and last question, a wee fun one. What are you reading just now? Well, I've usually got a few things on the go. Um, mm. There's that novel, the first novel by Guy Fay, the Airdrie called The Young Team. I've forgotten his name. I've uh, been dipping into that. It's a novel in, in kind of. In, Kind of Scots, kind of like uh, a new generation, train spotting for a new generation. No, uh, Graham Armstrong? That's the fella. That's the yeah. fella. Graham, Graham Armstrong's uh, young team. Um, I've been dipping in and out of um, Don Patterson's anthology, The Zoo of the New. My and dad also, gave me a book of his when I went off to China, so I wouldn't miss Dundee. Ah, Patterson. Oh, I, I've kept Patterson for a long time. He's some boy. <laughs> yeah. He's a devil as a guitar player, you know. I mean, he, he plays jigs and reels in three-part harmony. Never mind Patterson for just a, a book I would recommend, though, is The Collected Poems of Michael Donaghy. Right. Uh, ed edited by Sean O'Brien, which has been out for a few years now, but I hung around in London with, with uh, Patterson and Donaghy. Donaghy mm. is a wonder, was a wonderful poet, awful nice man, tied far too young. Uh, so I'm reading that, and then I'm also reading Wolf Hall. Oh, yeah. I managed to miss Wolf Fall when it came out, and I watched it on telly and thought, this is wonderful. So um, I'm reading my way through the whole trilogy. Oh, when it came out on TV, my dad said, I was watching Game of Thrones, and my dad mm. is 
was being an awful snob and saying, oh, it seems the same, same way he is about Harry Potter, just sneering at it. He's like, you should watch Wolf Hall. It's like Game of Thrones, but um, real history. And I, I was like, okay, whatever. And then blanked it. But I've heard it's really good. So I should get yeah. over my um, parental it issues to check it out. Yeah. 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 I mean, yes, of course, I, I was blown away by Game of Thrones as well. I, mean, mm. I never thought I would see a, a fantasy series, you know, so much money put into it. But of course, Lord of the, the Lord of the Rings films were the kickoff for that. If it hadn't right. been for, for Jackson and the Lord of the Rings, then you would never have Game of Thrones. No. Uh, I tried to read, I read some of the Game of Thrones books and he's not, he'll keep you turning on the pages, but he's not a great writer. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's for the story and the characters, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I okay. thought the TV stuff. I didn't actually see the last. I disconnected my telly, um, and uh, I heard such bad reviews of the final series of Game of Thrones. I didn't bother. Mm, I liked it, but um, I liked the end of Lost as well. I, I'm pretty convinced that the critics are wrong. But yeah. Anyway, um, before we start just talking about um, Game of Thrones for another mm-hmm. hour, I should probably just say thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, it's been a real pleasure, you know. I mean, hopefully we can do this again. Uh, there's a lot more we could, t- we could talk about. And um, also that we can meet in real life with a, a refreshing beverage. Nice wee bevy, yeah. Yes. That would well, be great. A, ref- a refreshing beverage once all of this nonsense is over. Yeah, a nice glass of Corona, maybe. Well, stay, stay wheel. Yeah. Uh, we'll Disney does, does, does means stay sober. Well, that's the end of my chat with Brian and we're approaching the end of the show. I think that was absolutely, absolutely very fun. That's a very poorly phrased sentiment. I think it was an absolutely great chat. That's what I can say. Um, So if you enjoyed the show, here's what you can do to give some feedback or just to follow our social media platforms. Uh, The Twitter for the show is just my own semi-professional one. It's a at Angus Likes Words. I'll tweet lots of stuff about translated Chinese fiction and occasionally just my own thoughts or my own ramblings. Or, But generally speaking, it's, it's about the stuff I talk about on the show that you'll see there on the Twitter. It's a great place to talk either in a little public tweet as a reply or, what, or mention or whatever. Also, the, the Twitter DMs are there and I reply to those pretty fast. Um, Instagram, this show has a, 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 an Instagram account dedicated entirely to the show and not to my inane, ridiculous life. And you can follow it at, at Trichific, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. Now, something I do on Twitter these days is I try to make uh, group chats for pretty much each episode. And I'm going to, just after I finish putting this episode together, I'm going to Assem- try and assemble people to make a Yang Lian uh, group or I think I'm going to actually make it a Misty Poets group um, just to catch all so to speak so if you'd like to join a Misty Poets group just follow that Instagram zap me a message and provided I can get more than two people so me plus one plus one I can make a group chat and then we can continue to add people to that wherever whenever we also already have a Chinese sci-fi group chat a a San Mao group chat and a Mo Yan group chat. So again, if you want to be added to those, contact that Instagram account and it, it i.e. me, will give you an invite. Um, there is a Facebook presence for this show too. That is a way to get in touch. There's a page, just search for the Translated Chinese Fiction podcast. And if you search in the groups, we have a discussion group for the show. It's pretty much dead, but you know, if you post there at the very least, I will respond to you, but hopefully some other listeners might too. Now, another thing I'd like to plug is uh, Shimalaya. So I upload these episodes to SoundCloud, and that uh, if then the feed is tracked to pretty much all the other worldwide podcast providers. But for the benefit of people uh, listening inside the PRC, where these well, where my host SoundCloud is blocked, and therefore all other access to the show is blocked, uh, inaccessible without a VPN, um, I've also uploaded it. Or I also upload every episode to a Chinese podcasting platform called Shimalaya. So um, there'll be a link for that. I'll tweet. But if you need the link for for the show on Shimalaya because you can't find it yourself and you want to listen inside China easily with no VPN or share it to friends there, no problem. Um, I'll, I'll send it to you. Consider it done. So that's the platforms. Now let's talk paying me money if you want to materially support the show 
which is by no means obligatory and I deliberately made that sound aggressive. There's two places you can do it. There's Patreon, which if you don't know, that's a place where you can give like a monthly contribution. There are hours of bonus material up there, which if, if you're a contributor, you get access to. I just uploaded one recently, a little um, ramble about uh, Gofei's flock of brown birds. And I've got a few more kind of backlog that I'm going to add roughly every week. I don't know if that'll be a habit, but I do know for the next few weeks there'll be new content up on the Patreon. If you are a bit intimidated by the idea of a regular donation that just keeps paying me money automatically and you'd rather give a one-off one, good news, uh, there's a website called Buy Me A Coffee where you can just give a one-off contribution. So uh, I will put the links to both those places on the show notes, but basically patreon.com slash trochufic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C, and the other one, buymeacoffee.com slash trochufic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. But you know what? There are more important things than money, and there are better ways of spreading the word about the show. And in my opinion, the best way to do that is by telling other people that you might be in think that you might think are interested. So tell your friends, tell your family, tell your colleagues, tell your Makar, that is your Scottish national poet. Although you might struggle to do that if you're not Scottish. So in the absence of a Makar, tell your local Shenren, your local fairy person or transcended sage. And in the lack of either of those things, just contact the local secret Commonwealth of Elvis fans and tell them and they really will get the word out. So just do all those things and until next time, next episode, Zaijian. <laughs> <laughs>